We also ask you all to mute yourselves. My name is Samhar Johannes, and I, along with my colleagues, Emily Colin, Susan Graham, and Jasmine Shoemaker, we run the Spotlight Guest Instructor Workshop Series. In this series, we invite university community members or friends to share their research and creative endeavors in a one-hour talk hosted in the library or virtually. Due to the ongoing success of the Spotlight Series, we have expanded the parameters to now create a semester-long theme symposium every fall semester. This fall semester, our symposium theme is prison incarceration. The symposium title is prison state. We aim to explore the regional and pervasive impact of prison incarceration in Maryland. The inspiration comes from the library's special collections, prison related materials, as well as the gallery exhibit being hosted this fall titled prison nation. Today, we welcome our fifth speaker of the symposium, Yannette Amaniwa. Yannette is the director of the public policy at the ACLU of Maryland. She has served as public policy advocate and interim public policy director twice before becoming the director. She began her advocacy career as a student at College Park, where she received her BA in sociology. She continued to pursue her passion in advocacy and organize an organization in several roles, including chief of staff for a public for Prince Georgia County's delegate, regional seven adult representative of the NAACP National Youth Works Youth Committee, young adult chair of the Prince Georgia County NAACP, and as a policy advocate at the Job Opportunities Task Force. Her presentation today is titled People Over Profit, What It Will Take to End the War on Marijuana and Achieve Police Brutality. And with that, I turn it over to our speaker. Hi everyone. Thank you again so much for having me here today. My name is Yannette Emanuel, um, and I am the Public Policy Director at the ACLU of Maryland. And I'm excited to talk to you all a little bit about, um, well, the work that we're doing in the legislature to address some of these issues. Um, I'm going to start first by talking and sharing with you all about um, the racist history of the war on marijuana specifically, um, but the arguments and context applies to the criminalization of all drugs. Um, but specifically want to focus on how former President Nixon launched the war on drugs in a deliberate effort to criminalize and um, control black and brown people in order to destabilize efforts um, in these communities to establish political control um, and, and community control of the institutions that govern our lives. Um, and I think that the, and also to suppress the anti-war movement that was happening at the time. Uh, and I think this background context is important for understanding um, the role, uh, the criminalization of marijuana and the war, and the war on drugs um, has uh, played in laying out the foundation for the um, police state that we currently live in. Um, and also how it is a strategy that is used uh, today um, and we see play out in arguments that we hear in the legislature um, against these proposals to uh, move away from incarceration and ending the war on drugs. Um, and uh, I think that'll it'll be helpful in, in setting the context for that. Um, the goal of this discussion is to both shed light on the fact that simply legalizing marijuana and expunging records for simple um, possession will not at all right the wrongs of the failed war on uh, marijuana or reduce racial disparities in arrests. And um, this discussion will also share the ongoing work um, in Maryland to address these issues, the challenges we continue to face, and how you all can support these efforts. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll also have plenty of time towards the end um, for you all to ask any questions or feedback on what I've shared with you all today. And with that, we can get started. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so some of you might already know this, but um, the earlier on, um, the marijuana was very, um, was popular and um, previously hemp was used to manufacture materials like rope, sales and textiles. Um, hemp was also exchanged as legal currency in states like Pennsylvania, Virginia and Maryland. 
Um, and by the 19th century, it, has it was so popular that medicinal marijuana products were sold openly in public pharmacies. And it wasn't until around the 1920s as the recreational use of marijuana became associated with black um, and brown people and uh, particularly immigrants um, was it then uh, villainized as this dangerous violent drug. There were folks coming in from Mexico after the Mexican Revolution of 1910 and just um, other folks coming into the United States and introducing the recreational use of marijuana. And also there also it was still very popular here as well, um, especially long, amongst um, musicians like jazz players. Um, and around this time when it was when the recreational use of marijuana is being associated with these groups is when you know propaganda started being spewed. Um, you would see these ads about uh, just how dangerous marijuana was and how it it it, uh, it um, is the reason why people commit violent acts of of, of crime. Um, also, that it would um, make white women more susceptible to um, sleeping with black men. Um, all types of crazy things. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, and this really set on uh, on track the U.S. to start criminalizing marijuana. The states were first, and later um, Congress followed. So by 1930s, 29 states had outlawed marijuana. Um, and in 1937, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, which made it made the importation, cultivation, and possession um, and distribution of marijuana um, uh, so that it could be regulated and made illegal. And in the first half of the uh, the first year that this bill had passed, um, black people were about three times more likely to be arrested for violating narcotic drug laws than whites, and Mexicans were nearly nine times more likely to be arrested for the same charge. And then by 1952, uh, Congress passed um, additional legislation that made sentencing for drug convictions mandatory. And so the first offense for marijuana possession could land someone up to two to five years in prison and a $2,000 fine. And we can go to the next slide. So at this point, marijuana had already started to be um, essentially made um, illegal in the United States. Uh, but the, the perception of marijuana slowly started to change around the 1960s and 70s as it was popularly more associated with um, hippies and the counterculture movement really challenged the stigma around um, marijuana. And, and as it became more popular in, um, it also became very popular uh, in upper um, white middle class um, communities. Um, and so the public perception of it being a violent drug started to change. Um, and some states did uh, start decriminalizing marijuana at this point. I think it was 11 states that had in, uh, by 1970 or the, by the end of the 1970s. Um, but it was still very much criminalized on the federal level. Um, and Nixon, which this video will help really highlight, is that part of Nixon's agenda when he was coming into office, especially the time that he was coming into office, was to gain control, social and political control, of uh, people at that time, and that that included the anti-war movement, but also black and the the efforts in black communities to gain political control and community control. Um, and one way he was, and at the time there was no, um, and the reason that he used the war on drugs, which will be explained in this video, is it was a method to be able to one put fear in people um, that there's this one rise in crime, and that we we should be fearing um, drug users and drug um, drug dealers. And really gave you know gave him a scape route to or an excuse to be able to um, funnel all this money into local police departments um, under the guise of curtailing the drug war, but really it was an effort to suppress uh, political activity and control black and brown communities. Um, and Nixon's aide later admits to this when he shares that it was you know the Nixon administration and, and the administrations after that. Um, was goal was to um, by publicly associating uh, the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin could criminalize both and criminalizing both heavily could disrupt those communities um, and could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news, which is exactly what was done. Um, and I'd like to play this video by Daru Ben Wahad, who is an um, activist, but also a former um, leader in the Black Panther Party, and he um, eloquently puts, you know, explains all of this um, and puts in the context um, just 
what the goal of the Nixon administration was and how effective they were um, and how we, we're still seeing a lot of this today. So if we could play the video. But having said that, these techniques of the counterintelligence program, divide and conquer, misinformation, defamation of character, arrest and coercion, physical violence, intimidation, terrorism, were all techniques that were employed in the antebellum South. But they developed and changed as America developed and changed. And by the 1960s, 1950s, America was undergoing a process of urbanization and the development of a global techno technological infrastructure. These developments, urbanization of America, the war in Vietnam, the migratory patterns of, of, of American working people, the struggles of African people for human rights, the struggles of women for their rights, the anti-war sentiments in the country, all constituted a nation about to explode. So when Richard Nixon ran for office, he ran on the ticket that he represented who? The silent majority. They weren't in the streets demonstrating. They weren't protesting the war. They weren't demanding better working wages. They weren't doing none of these things. They was a silent, suffering majority. You know, the same ones that Sarah Palin calls the real Americans. Hmm? Same crew. I used to say back then, the silent majority. Every time I drove past the cemetery, I said, there's Nixon's silent majority. But he ran on this ticket of he was representing the American people. He was representing the people who didn't have a voice, who weren't out in the street demonstrating, who were hardworking people. Middle America. You know, Pat's Blue Ribbon, Redneck, White Sox. Red, white, and blue. He represented them. But his problem was he didn't have a national police force to repress all of this protest and all of this movement. And you remember, those of you who have seen all the movies and stuff about the counterculture, you know about the hippie movement, right? You know about the counterculture, um, the Timothy Leary uh, a version of, of, of history, you know, tune in, uh, tune out, you know, turn on, tune out. 1967 was the summer of love. Demonstrators were sticking flowers down National Guard barrels and, you know, police, uh, gun barrels. This was the summer of love. This was a period where counterculture was beginning to supplant the mainstream culture, especially amongst the youth. And a consequence of this, of course, was that young whites began to interact more with black people on a very fundamental level. You know, like smoking weed together, <laughs> freaking out at concerts, listening to Jimi Hendrix bug out and play the guitar backwards, you know, jumping up and down like like a puppet, you know, to the doors, you know. Even John Lee Hooker had to come back. All the old blues musicians, Rolling Stones, were paying tribute to old blues. This was an era in which blacks and the culture of, quote, the counterculture would begin to come together. So Nixon was very shrewd. He said, well, we can't have this. This is getting out of control. So he ran on the ticket of representing the silent majority. He launched the war on drugs. He established an alliance with the Mexican government and began to spray the marijuana crops with Pacquai, which was a form of Asian orange. He sprayed the marijuana crops with Pacquai, the Asian orange, and people started smoking that stuff when it came across the border and bugged out. But the war on drugs was Nixon's initiative. And what was the purpose of the war on drugs? To consolidate law enforcement, to politicize law enforcement, to give law enforcement the opportunity to acquire military skills for domestic repression under the guise of curtailing the importation of legal drugs. So he launched the war on drugs as soon as he came into office, and he established the law enforcement uh, administra assistance Administration, LEA, L-E-A-A. And LEA was designed to provide federal funding to local police agencies. If you had two black people in town, you qualified for anti-riot 
government subsidies. Didn't make a difference whether the two black people in town were two professors or not. You, you were qualified for federal funding to prepare your police department to deal with racial unrest. This was the purpose of the Law Enforcement Assistance Association. And it was out of this particular program that the SWAT team training, the, 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 the relationship between the military and domestic police became regularized and institutionalized. It was out of the law enforcement, the, uh, out of the LEA mandate that FEMA was formed. You all know about FEMA. I mean, all we have to do is just reflect back on Katrina, and we know about FEMA. But did we know that the Timothy McVeighs and the so-called right-wing all Americans who support, support the Sarah Palins and the John McCain's were all in state militias, began to become politicized in state militias that were given charters under the LEAA administration. You can stop the video there, but I, I definitely encourage folks to check out um, his full lecture. Um, but he laid out some critical information that is really relevant to understanding what we have to undo to get us to a place where we're actually going to be able to end the war on drugs. Um, but a, a note that I want to make also is that Nixon's running mate was, Spir uh, was Spiro um, Agnew, who was former governor of Maryland. And one of the reasons that he even got Nixon's attention to um, being even considered as his running mate was because of Agnew's response to the uprisings in Maryland. He's very critical and condemned the uprisings in Baltimore City and also Cambridge. Um, Cambridge, Maryland was under martial law for almost two years um, after in 63 uh, because they were protesting the segregation of public accommodations, but also police brutality. Um, and he was vehemently opposed to protests, even if they were peaceful and um, and uh, got Nixon's attention because he that's exactly what he was trying to do is suppress black political activity. And so uh, he picked him to be his running mate. Um, and I think when we look at the harmful policies in Maryland that we're trying to undo, it's really important to um, look at the the framework and, and understand the his, you know the historical context of how we actually got here. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So as soon as um, Nixon got into office, the first thing he did um, was launch uh, or declared that drug abuse was public enemy number one. Um, he repealed the Marijuana Tax Act and made marijuana a schedule one drug. Um, he also uh, created the Drug Enforcement Administration um, to target illegal drug use um, and also again funneling money into these local police departments. The Reagan administration um, greatly expanded the reach of the war on drugs um, by uh, focusing on um, punishment over treatment, um, which essentially led to, um, for, it, which increased the incarcerations for nonviolent drug offenses from 50,000 in 1980 to 400,000 in 1997. And we can go to the next slide. That's the it's slide? It's, it's not up. It's on a Richard Nixon uh, page. I think you're on, it's on a different tab. Let me go back here. There we go. Thank you. And if we could go to the next slide. So now to bring it back to present day. Um, so in 2014, Maryland uh, decriminalized possession of uh, 10 grams or less of marijuana and the effort, uh, you know, the, the logic there was that under, we understand the harmful effects of the war on marijuana war on drugs, but essentially the specifically the criminalization of marijuana and the um, racial disparities in arrest. And so in order to tackle this issue, although we're not ready to fully legalize, we're going to decriminalize. Well, decriminalization definitely was not uh, didn't make any difference um, at all. Um, and despite decriminalization um, from 2014 to 2020, nearly 100,000 people have been criminalized for simply possessing marijuana. Um, and we've also seen trends of 
an uptick in people being charged with possession with intent to distribute. Um, because instead of charging people with possession, officers have started charging them with possession with intent to distribute because that is now a civil offense under 10 grams. They then have um, uh, deferring to um, charging them with intent to distribute. Um, and while national trends reveal that on, on average, a black person is 3.64 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession, in some Maryland counties, people are arrested at double the national average. So, for instance, in Queens and County, uh, black people are eight times more likely to be arrested for marijuana. In Carroll County, in Carroll County, Cecil and Frederick, black people are six times more likely to be arrested for marijuana, and five times more likely in Anag in Allegheny County. And um, despite identical rates of use uh, amongst races, black people make up the majority of possession arrests. And um, despite only making um, only 29% of the population, black people account for 59% of all marijuana possession arrests in 2020. So this is after decriminalization. So we can go to the next slide. We can go to the next slide. Um, again, this is just comparing the different um, arrest rates uh, between possession for 10 grams, and this is for possession of more than 10 grams. So this is still what carries a misdemeanor offense in Maryland. Um, black people are three and a half times more likely to be charged with possession of more than 10 grams um, as compared to white people. Next slide. So legalization is not enough and looking at other states, this is, this is what is evident. Um, a 2020 report that the national ACLU released found that while arrests for general, a generally increase in states that have decriminalized and legalized marijuana, racial disparities still exist. So while less people are getting arrested, um, who's getting arrested hasn't changed. Um, arrests fell in Washington state and Colorado after they legalized marijuana. However, um, racial disparities um, continued at pre legislation rates. And in some states that have legalized marijuana, like Maine and Massachusetts, racial disparities and arrests were actually larger in 2018 than in 2010. In Virginia, which recently legalized a couple years ago, um, a few years ago, despite recreational marijuana being legalized in 2021, police are still more likely to arrest black people than white people for marijuana related offenses. Um, and black people are accounted for nearly 60% of marijuana related offenses in, um, in Virginia. And Washington DC, while has seen overall decrease in marijuana arrests, black people still account for roughly 90% of marijuana related charges, despite making up 45, only 45% of the city's population. And this is really important because the legislation that we passed last session doesn't nearly do anything um, to prevent these trends from continuing. We, the question is on the ballot. We've, um, to set up automatic expungement for single possession of marijuana, but have done nothing to actually change um, the police practices that allow them to um, one have these unnecessary interactions with people solely due to marijuana, um, but also eliminating criminal penalties. It makes no sense um, to say this is now legal. People who are 21 um, can use it and then continue to still um, criminalize even possessing it. Um, and also criminalizing people for selling marijuana while we're getting ready to allow wealthy Marylanders to legally sell marijuana. Um, and so we've seen from other states that simply legal legalizing is not going to solve um, the issues. And if we are in, in the kind of the rhetoric that has been shared by um, politicians when in fate when talking about their um, in favor for legalization, their main argument is that, you know, because it's because they understand the harm of the war on drugs. Um, but to be consistent in kind of what we're saying and what is being said and what is actually happening, um, the policies have to reflect that as well. And we can go to the next slide. So this is sharing some of the things that we're working on. Um, we worked on last year, but didn't get far and are going to bring back again this year. So one of the things um, is prohibiting police from using the odor of marijuana as a basis to stop an individual, an individual or perform a warrantless search of a vehicle. Marijuana is often used as um, an excuse for police to stop and search people, mostly as uh, an excuse for them to racially profile people. Um, and it leads to unnecessary police interactions and, and dangerous police interactions. Um, we, and we even get calls uh, from folks who are medical marijuana 
patients, but they're black and um, the commission for whatever reason is delayed in issuing cards to folks. And these individuals are being targeted and harassed by police for um, and being charged with possession and intent to distribute when they are when they're patients themselves. But also just people who are whether they're, you know, there's lots of reasons why people smoke in their cars because they can't smoke outside or it's cold outside and they can't smoke in their homes. They'll go in their cars and a car can smell like marijuana for days. Um, but police will use that um, as an excuse to search them looking for other, you know, criminal activity. And that goes back to kind of the racist history of uh, the roots of the, the roots of the racist history of marijuana and how it is. The association between black people or, or brown people and the association between uh, marijuana and criminalization um, and that we're still seeing that very much today in the policies and also the pushback and um, challenges that we're facing in eliminating these uh, uh, provisions. The other thing that we're working on is eliminating criminal penalties for possession and possession with intent to distribute because like I mentioned, without eliminating these penalties, black people will continue to be vulnerable to existing arrest patterns um, where black people will be saddled with these criminal penalties despite marijuana being legalized. Um, and legalization should not only address past harms but also prevent future harms. And so unless we eliminate these criminal penalties, the cycle will continue and we'll have done nothing to actually um, address the war but have now made it legal for one set of the state but not the other. Um, and the other, you know, the other layer of it is that now the state will be um, benefiting from the legalization of marijuana, and there will be an even more um, aggressive approach to trying to get the black market under control, um, and will exacerbate not only um, racial disparities and arrests, but also these harmful and unnecessary police interactions. Next slide. The other thing is. Public consumption, um, not treating marijuana in, a, in in public, smoking marijuana in public, similar to smoking a cigarette in public, will result in poor Black people facing the brunt of the enforcement and unnecessary police interactions. So, in the legislation that we passed last session, um, it's still a, it's still a citable offense. Um, folks will be charged. I think the first offense is a, it's two fifty, and the second offense it's is five hundred dollars. And um, it just, it, it again, makes no sense. We're legalizing it. Uh, we're saying folks can smoke it, um, but we're still going to police where people can and cannot do it. Um, and it will lead to these unnecessary police interactions um, that we're trying to prevent and, and move away from. Um, and for people, again, who are already marginalized, do not have the luxury of consuming in private. And so, it will again be people who uh, are people of color, but also um, in working class communities that are gonna face the brunt of this enforcement. Next slide, please. The other important um, aspect is also expanding redress opportunities. While we've done uh, accomplished automatic exposure for simple possession, um, that's not nearly enough and we need to expand um, to and um, in addition to expungement, need to look at vacature for previous marijuana related convictions. Uh, vacature goes a step further than expungement and actually undoes the adjudication and says it should never happened. Um, and this is particularly important, especially for those who are immigrants and going through the immigration proceeding. Um, as long as marijuana is still criminalized on the federal level, um, expungement is not enough to um, potentially avoid uh, federal immigration consequences. But vacature and the state legalizing and saying this, you know, we should have never criminalized this, you know, we'll vacate this charge will actually be able to help immigrant populations, whereas expungement just nearly won't go far enough. Um, and the other thing is expanding um, redress opportunities to include reconsideration hearings um, and vacature for people currently serving time for marijuana related convictions and other low level felonies and misdemeanors if those charges stem from a conviction based. Um, in a search due to the odor of marijuana. And this is to undo, again, some of these um, violations of people's Fourth Amendment rights, um, where, and a lot of times, someone's not just simply charged with marijuana. It's marijuana and a bunch of other charges. And so to get at these other charges as well and not just deal with simple possession, um, creating opportunities for people to have uh, basically review hearings where um, new facts and where we are now are considered and whether they're resentenced or released. Um, 
and the other thing is reparations for the failed war on marijuana. So something we I'm very proud of what we did last year was pass in the legalized in HB 37, which is a companion bill to the, the question uh, HB 1, which put the question on the ballot is it establishes a reinvestment uh, reparations reinvestment uh, community fund, um, which is going to require that 30, at least 30% of the tax revenue from marijuana sales when we eventually set up the industry in Maryland will go directly to local communities that have been the most impacted by the war on drugs, looking at the arrest rates for the last 30 years. Um, and this, uh, this model empowers communities most harmed to have a role in deciding how to, the money is just dis distributed. Um, and also the money, um, in the legislation specifically said this money cannot go to police and it cannot go to replace, um, uh, existing government funding, which is what a lot of other states have done, and we learning you know learning lessons from what other states have done, wanted to avoid those same mistakes here, um, and also just wanted to make sure that the money is going directly to the communities, um, and that in only the only way that the local councils can use this money is by passing a local ordinance, um, stating how that money is going to be used, and uh, we only got thirty percent of that revenue. And we initially asked for 60% and, and are going to be advocating that that number increases. To at least 60%. Um, next slide, please. So, going back to the community control of police, um, the. As, um, Ben Wahad was as was talking about, um, at the time in 68 and 67, not only was there, um. Protests happening to uh, challenge economic injustice, housing, um, and segregation. There were also uh, calls for community control of the police, because understanding that the police were not protecting um, black and brown communities and were brutalizing a lot of them. Um, there was a lot of organizing at that time, especially by the Black Panther Party, to get community control of the police. Um, and this demand of community control recognizes that the most effective way to deter the dehumanization of black and brown people is for the community to have the ability to levy consequences against those that harm our community. And so community oversight is defined by a community controlled and operated entity that lives outside of the institution of law enforcement and or law enforcement processes and can impose discipline, adjudicate discipline and investigate misconduct. And so in 2021, when we worked to repeal the law enforcement officers bill of rights, at the same time, we were also advocating for community oversight of the police. Um, through that came the Maryland Police Accountability Act of 2021, which did repeal the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights um, and did create uh, did demand police accountability boards in each county in Baltimore City. Um, what it failed to do is really include these critical oversight components, which includes um, invest independent investigatory powers, subpoena powers. And the ability for this board to, um, to decide discipline. And so something we're going to continue to advocate for is that these boards have the power. We're trying there. The infrastructure is being set up now where they, these boards exist in every county, but there's still a lot of work to do to actually empower them and actually make sure that these, com these boards reflect the community. I think we've had more success in some places like Montgomery County and, and Prince George's County with this, but there's still a lot more work to do to make sure that this is actually a community controlled entity and that they have the the tools that they need to actually hold police accountable. Um, and so something we're going to be advocating for this legislative session is for uh, enabling legislation that will simply allow local jurisdictions, if they so wish, to give these boards um, the investory powers. Um, and, it, it, and I think it's it's full circle because in order to one um, end the war on marijuana, we have to um, pass these reforms that will, or pass these legislation that will um, eliminate these criminal penalties, uh, um, limit unnecessary police interactions, but also the community control aspect of it is really critical because in order to really, um, you know, legalization alone or legislation alone is not going to change police practices. And so in, by having the community and having the police be responsive to the community will be the only way to actually one deter misconduct, but also change the police culture and how they um, are, are um, a, you know, what tools they're using, um, how they're enforcing these policies, and, and the amount of discretion that they have to enforce these policies. Um, and so that kind of is, is the summary of the, what is going on, the important components um, that need to be addressed in order to um, adequately address the war on marijuana in Maryland um, and what is needed. So I know I've, I've covered a whole lot, um, so I wanna also open up 
for folks to answer, uh, ask any questions or provide any feedback on anything that was shared. People are welcome to use chat or audio to ask questions. Kelly? Hi there, um, Yannette. I'm so grateful to you for your presentation today, but also for your leadership. Um, I'm Kelly Quinn um, from the Choice Program at UNBC, and I'm in solidarity and coalition with Yannette and the ACLU, but a number of other organizations to work on these issues. And it's the coalition where, so I'm, you know, a huge fan, um, not just of you, but James Baldwin. I love sitting on calls with you and when, when he's in the background um, and, and really helping us think about a different world and, and to make it so in Maryland. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about how you pull people together in coalition. Like, I know to show up because I get an email. Um, but it strikes me as something that's really thoughtful about how you bring people together around certain issues. And um, if you could just think, of, could, if you could help us think a little bit about that, when we want to work for these issues, how do we do a power analysis or asset mapping to think about how we can be really effective at the local level and then also at the state level? Um, that would be really helpful to me and maybe to others on the call as well. So I wanted to thank you for your talk and for your leadership. And also, P.S., just the ban the odor is so important for the youth of choice. Um, so I, I really want to thank you for that leadership. Our, our young people are um, disproportionately affected, um, of course, by this, and um, and this is is really going to change people's lives. Um, so I, I wanted to thank you for that on behalf of out myself, but also on on behalf of the the young people that we work with in Maryland. So thanks. Thank you so much, and thank you for your question. Um, that's a great question. I believe in the Ella Baker School uh, model of organizing. And something that she was really big on is developing relationships with the people that you're trying to work with. And so I think for me, a lot of the folks that I work with are folks that I've been working with for years on a number of different issues or community pe or people in the community that I have developed relationships with. And one of the um, you know ways that you get people to show up or, or build a base is by showing up for them. Um, so it's not just uh, a transaction, but. These are folks I'm, I'm, I'm at, well, for the most part, these are people I am in community with, people I've worked with on a number of issues. Um, and so, uh, and then when also trying to, in, uh, you know, educate people about these issues, trying to speak directly to what they care about and how it impacts them. Um, in our coalition, we're very intentional about um, centering people who've been impacted, uh, not only in the decision making, um, but also in, in everything that we're doing. Um, there are folks on our steering committee. Um, and the way that we met them was because they reached out to us for help. But some of them I, I've known through my years in the NAACP. Um, and I think that also we're just so much stronger when we work together. I think that the 2021 legislative session was a great example of that. When all of the coalition, when all the organizations are united front and are saying this is what we're, you know, we're advocating for, this is what we're prioritizing, it really puts the legislator in a position where they have to respond. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it really backs them in the corner and that's how I think if that was the really that in the moment we were in as well, um, is really what helped us pass the reforms that we did that year and building off of that. Um, I think it's really trying to show up for people in, in, um, for them, but also the issues that we work on are issues that directly speak to the issues that they're seeing in their communities. So it's not a, you know, a new issue that we're trying to explain to them, but these are things that they're seeing in their community. So a lot of um, our partners who have been victims of police violence have also witnessed um, people they love or in their communities be um, targeted and, and harassed over something like the odor of marijuana. And so while maybe they themselves hate marijuana, hate the smell of it, don't want their kids using it, they do. They don't want people. They don't want people being criminalized for it, especially you know people that look like them. Um, and so making that connection, and and a lot of one on ones as well, um, developing relationships one on one 
with uh, coalition partners has helped. Um, but the biggest part is just being a part of the communities and working with people who are already there and already working on these issues um, instead of trying to, I guess, build a whole new coalition. A lot of this work is already happening. It's just about going to those to those people. Um, and I think that's helped us um, build a strong campaign around these issues. We have a question in chat. The question is, do you think the potential transfer of the police department from state control to city control might impact this work? Um, is that specifically are, is a question around um, marijuana and um, or around the community control piece? Just to clarify before I answer the question. Oh, gotcha. Yes, I do think it'll make um, I do think it'll make a difference. I think that um, as an org from an organizer perspective, you have I have an easier time reaching a council member or a council than a statewide legislation a le legislator, um, especially on issues that are specific to that community. So even in like empowering the Baltimore Civilian Review Board. I think it, you know, once we have local control, I think it'll be easier to advocate that this, uh, that one, the two boards combined, the the civilian review board and the police accountability board are able to combine, but also that they have these powers that they need. I think from an organizer perspective, I can organize people in districts, um, you know, where who you're when we determine who our target legislators are, be able to organize in their districts, and it, it's easier to focus the the argument and the organizing into one community than trying to like convince people in the Eastern Shore or, or um, in Montgomery County that they should give Baltimore City um, local control or um, the policies that we're advocating for. Like Hopkins is a great example of that, like the private police force that should be left up, left up to the council to decide um, and implement. And it'd be easier to organize and, you know, against it. But we had to deal with a statewide legislator and people who don't even live in Baltimore City, never, you know, never frequent bar Baltimore City get to decide on the creation of this private police force. Um, so as much as we can localize things, I think the easier it is to organize our communities in response to it. So, um, if we don't have any questions, um. As far as like how folks can support these efforts this session, um, there's lots of ways. Um, one is by testifying in Annapolis. Um, it, we might be returning in person this session, so that might make things more difficult as it was in previous sessions, but still very important, um, both written or oral testimony. I think also in addition to that is organizing your communities. Um, all of us are in community with other folks who might not be informed about these issues or what's happening in Annapolis. Um, so informing folks in your communities about what's going on and getting them to also weigh in is really important. Um, requesting a meeting with your legislators. Um, I mean, I can't, as a former staffer to a legislator, um, I know just how much legislators listen to their constituents, even if they don't seem like it, they're having like 50, 500 people contact them about the same thing immediately the response is okay what do you need me to do um so organizing your community your networks is huge volunteering to make calls to legislators um host a teach-in um with folks in your network who don't know this information and could use um the information also you could organize a lobby day um Kelly, if you want to, you know, get a group of students to come down to Annapolis and meet with different legislators, that is something that our engagement team would love to support you with. Um, letter writing campaigns, getting students or, or yourselves um, in your communities to write letters to your legislators, different emails. Um, all of this, I think, makes a huge difference because I think when we're in Annapolis um, and we're making these arguments about these issues, a lot of time. Uh, They'll try to make it seem like it's just, you know, you or this group that cares about it, not realizing that there's so many more people who are impacted by these issues than are able to pay attention to what's going on to the day day in Annapolis or what's going on in, in the advocacy community, but are very much still impacted by these issues. And so being able to show that they're actually people who do care about these issues, who want these same things is really important. 
And the other thing that I'll note about the legislate, like the reform that I mentioned around eliminating criminal penalties and possession with intent and eliminating odor searches and everything like that. We did a poll last year and found that the majority of Marylanders surprise and to my surprise really are in support of these reforms. Um, there's about 65% of Marylanders who said that they um, supported eliminating odor searches for marijuana so that police can actually spend their time and resources on more productive things. Um, and that 13% said that act that they were not in favor for legalization, but if that was a factor, that would be more, make them more likely to support legalization. So I think the rest of Maryland is a lot more aligned than maybe some of our legislators are, and they just need to hear from the people. Um, can you let us know how we could meet you if we have any follow up questions or people want to contact, talk to you about some of their concerns? Absolutely, I will drop my email in the chat. Um, that is the best way to reach me. Um, I also, I think I shared a link to my um, Twitter account. Um, we share a lot of. Um, updates on Twitter and just what's going on as well. So I'll drop my ad there and then I'll also drop a link to the. I still have it up um, the presentation. I'm sorry, the lecture by Ben Wahad, because I think he did such a great job. Um, and explained so many critical things that I think would be helpful as well. Um, so um, is there any questions before I head out? Thank you all so much again for having me. Is it all right if I share a copy of your slides when I send yeah. out? So um, just to let everybody know, um, I'm going to be sending out a copy of this recording. And if it's all right with you, Annette, I'll send a copy of the slides. That's it. Okay, great. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. I think um, thank one hand up. I'm sorry. Paula, oh, Paula? I know I put it up last minute. You know, thank you for your presentation. I just have a tad bit of thing to share mm -hmm. um, to help let you know that your work is um, is valuable and people are paying attention. Um, I live in Baltimore City, and the last jury case I had was for um, possession, and the possession was because the officers who were going east on one road and the Four young men of color in the car were going west, the opposite direction. It was not a warm day, so the windows were not down, but apparently the officers were able to smell marijuana. So they did a U-turn, chase the fellas, um, chase after them, ran after them, and in this foot patrol, supposedly one of the young men threw a gun over into some other person's building. The gate was like six feet tall, yet he saw that in a foot chase. <laughs> So, in any event, if there's any consolation, the um, juror members, we did not buy it and we did not send that poor fellow to jail forever. Um, if it helps, that is so great to hear. Thank you you're, for sharing that. You're welcome. So, thank you for what you're doing as well. Really appreciate that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. And um, we hope to see you at future Spotlight Symposium lectures, everybody. Have a good day, guys. Bye. Thanks a lot. Solidarity. Have a great Friday. Stop recording.